Hey, sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to another edition of Court Call with Ronnie Nunn. As we all know, Ronnie was an NBA referee for 19 years, and for five more was head of officials, and then for three more was a director of development. So, Ronnie, I'm really happy to have you here. It sounds like you're in a good mood having watched a little bit of the postseason for the uh, college. What's happening on that end for you? Well, on that end, the NIT champions are my alma mater, GWU, George Washington University, and uh, it's a long time coming for them to really make a mark. Uh, great recruiting at, at GW. I think it's always been an international location. I'm glad to see the coaches, starting with Jarvis and now with the great Mike Larnigan, has brought it to reality of getting some better numbers on the years and recruiting abroad. Uh, and making it a real international school, and it, and it should be. It, it was great. And uh, I know Walt Zerbiak, who's the dad of uh, Wally Zerbiak, and I and some others during that time, especially the talent family of three ex ex outstanding basketball players, helped lay the groundwork. But also before that guy, Red Auerbach, was the, uh, was the big, well-known GWU guy. So it's, it's great to see them win it, and I'm, I'm really happy. So let's... Let's talk about what you want. I'm in a good mood. All right. Well, congratulations to, G to GW. And uh, we might have a little bit of uh, con con uh, consolation for the Celtics because they were able to end the Warriors' record home, game home winning streak. And right. uh, it was in a ridiculously intense game. Lots of stuff happening. So let's break right into it because in the final minute we had some interesting plays. The first one we want to talk about is uh, a play where the Celtics were trying to run a little offense through the high post, and Amir Johnson and Draymond Green get a little tangled up. Uh, yeah. So there's a couple things here. There was a potential maybe foul, perhaps, that wasn't called, but then what I thought was more interesting is what happened when the ball and the players were on the ground. Ronnie, walk us through what you're seeing here on both the foul and what happened after that, and whether you think this was processed correctly. Well, you know, you can see from uh, the play that initially Green has his hand on the ball and uh, and then he loses his hand off the ball. And then I think it looks like he fouls uh, Amir. Now, if a referee wants to videotape that back and he sees the play just become a debacle, go back to the initial thing that occurred and he could have stopped this if he has a good view now, number one, they're hoping he has a good view, uh, that you just call it a jump ball before it gets really down onto the floor. The second part of it is now Amir has the ball. We can we have a great angle via the camera that he's calling the timeout first. Now Draymond Green goes over him. I don't think he his body really crushes him, but he goes over him to get the ball as well. And now it looks like to another official that the guy that really has the ball first is Draymond Green, and he offers him the timeout. So Amir is asking for a timeout initially. We see it. Draymond Green comes with a secondary timeout. And unfortunately, the angles that were provided for the officials did not see this situation. But it all starts with the wrestling match. Something has to be cleaned up in the wrestling match, and that may help. And uh, at times, at, at this time in the game, you know, uh, officials want to see players play, but the standards still have to be made and, and whistled appropriately. So the game does finish with everybody doing their part. So we see that Draymond gets his hand in the cookie jar originally on the ball and putting a lot of pressure. I guess where the argument could very well be that, um, you know, he's got the hand on the ball and maybe a little bit less contact on Amir, and Amir spins, and then that's sort of what gets him to the ground because I know a lot of people were arguing that he had his hand up into there and then literally propels him with the left arm down into the ground. Uh, do you feel like there's interpretation for that where it wouldn't necessarily be a foul? Uh, if he kept his hand on the ball throughout it, um, then 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 you can see that it, it it is a foul because he must. I think he keeps his hand on the ball and then slides off. And there's two parts of hand ball and then a foul. You can have you can have a hand on the ball, and if it's if it's quick enough, I should say if it's held onto there enough, you can call a jump ball. You can go back to that even if though a foul may occur after it because sometimes you can't keep a hand on the ball continually if it ends up coming off based on a player trying to get away from you. So I think Amir spins, the hand comes off the ball, and now you're talking about a foul. And if you can see this clearly, I would easily go back to the jump because the ball pressured against the body is still a jump ball situation as okay. long as somebody is there, uh, you know, as, as the ball is being kind of caught in the middle of this thing. Uh, but anyway, it didn't happen. It looks like a foul. And then we have an issue then with a timeout. So there are three situations that occur 
And then the final situation seems like a mayor who originally called the foul didn't get what he should have. And then what do you make of, we, we were able to spy uh, Brad Stevens standing next to Monty McCutcheon, literally comes on the court. He is, I mean, and I know it's loud, it's crazy, it's a last minute. He's literally clapping in his ear, frantically signaling while Amir Johnson has control of the ball on the ground for the timeout. And, you know, there's just nothing. I guess we have to chalk it up to the referee. It's just loud. He can't hear it. Is that right? Well, it's also, I, I, I get a sense he knows there's chaos going on, but his eyes are, are, are in a point where he's fastened onto the play. Yeah. And he's trying to, he's trying to un, un, peel the onion on this play. And so he knows that the timeout, you know, one thing officials don't want to do is give a, a timeout that is undeserving. Sometimes we have to let the play open up more to say, you know what? There was really a timeout asked here, and there was enough time. Sometimes people want to call a timeout while they recognize that the ball is going to be a jump ball, that they really don't have full possession alone. Okay. So all that goes through the mind of an official. He opts not to call it. He wants the, the scrum to kind of figure itself out. And I think he was a little delayed on that. Of course, we watch it in slow-mo. It looks a, lot, looks a lot more obvious. But in real time, that's a quick turn of events. And I think that's why he hesitates. And, of course, a coach who wants what he wants – sees the immediacy of that timeout, and uh, he doesn't get it. So that's why he's out there begging for the timeout for us to respond as officials. Yeah, that would be tough. As a coach, I'd be livid. I, I don't even know if I could calm down after that, knowing that we lost the possession on that to the, to the Warriors, the, you know, in a way that we, it seems like it would have been reasonable to get that timeout and, and keep the ball. And yeah. the, well, th that leads us to our next clip. Which, you know, I keep watching it on Vine. It went pretty viral out there with people looking at it. And the funny thing was, I missed it in the beginning because I was watching Isaiah Thomas and Steph Curry in the corner that whole time. And uh, when I watch it now, I can't stop laughing. And I don't really know why I find it so humorous, Ronnie. But, um, you know, it's the last play of the game. The Warriors are down by three. And, you know, I, I like the play. They screen for Draymond first with Harrison Barnes, who's then supposed to get a, a, a pin down for Clay Thompson. And I got to tell you, I don't know if you've seen anything like this before, but it, it's just, it's a carnival out there <laughs> of, of, of craziness. How are, what, what do you think is supposed to happen on this play? You know, the play really, you know, there's one thing officials must always remember, the denominator of the game is making the calls that warrant an illegal action, you put a whistle in it. And don't make the calls that don't warrant your whistle. So in this case, I mean, Draymond Green's attempting to to set these screens, to set a screen, and, and his opponent slips. Well, he doesn't slip to trip him on purpose, but he slips, and he trips Draymond Green. I mean, that play alone, that's got to be stopped right there because whatever that player Draymond Green was getting ready to do, he now cannot do it. And in fact, since that play is let go, the second play gets all messed up and is even worse because now he tries to get up to make the screen he's been set to do, and it's a, it's a bad screen, and you got the defender on that rolling over his back. So, yeah, man, I mean, this is circus-like, but the problem here for me is the officials who try to be judicious uh, put themselves in a situation by trying to apply a malleable set of circumstances for the game and some things are malleable when i say that i think words like marginal versus illegal but in this case this is too obvious not to address you have to address it even though you may address the second foul and maybe didn't address the first one because uh, draymond got got you know he got tripped so whatever it is just call the plays so people will get out of their minds that it's 8.3 that the fans believe the, the referees put the whistles in the pocket. They want the players to, to win the game. And there is good thought about that, and everybody would love that in a perfect world. But, you know, it's the Murphy's Law thing here. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen, and this happens. And who ends up holding the bag? The officials. And that's why I say, when it's time to throw strikes, don't fool around with curves. It's a three-and-two count with the bases loaded. Throw the ball over the plate. And this is one of those situations for me, since I'm a ba I love baseball so much. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we, we're not big baseball lovers over here, but certainly, yeah, it, it seems crazy that nothing would have been called. Um, I suppose, right, the, the argument could have been that they call the foul, you know, on um, Evan Turner for tripping, you know, even if it's incidental. Uh, that I, I don't know if they're in the bonus. Even if they're in the bonus, is that is that a two shots and then the ball goes back to the Celtics? What would happen if they called the foul on the initial trip? 
Uh, yeah, on the initial trip, you're absolutely right. That would be considered an away from the play foul, one shot by any player on the Golden State team, <laughs> and, and possession. Yeah. And possession because it's two minutes and down. So that might be also going through the players' minds, uh, the, the referees' minds, that you don't want to penalize a severe play, and you're hoping to, again, you're hoping the play will kind of un, uh, kind of unfold in a good way. And by the way, it's really interesting. You know, the Celtic player trips, and then – Damon Green creates a, a bad uh, screen, so it's kind of a wash. And by the way, you know, Curry gets his shot off, which he usually makes, and he misses this time. But if he made it, I really wonder, you know, all the, the noise that would be made. But these are obvious plays that you, you can't put away and put on a shelf and say, it's a parking lot play, I'll get back to it. You, you have to deal with these plays because that's your job. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you can help the game by uh, letting plays go when they are marginal in nature. You have to call the play. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, as I'm looking at this again, I did happen to catch just a little bit of a whack on Steph's hand on the release, uh, which oh. they also didn't call, um, which, you know, that might be a little bit par for the course. We've seen, you know, uh, that kind of contact maybe kind of go, uh, let go, um, you know, at the end of a game like that. And, you know, they, they ended up getting another, another whack at it anyway after all that. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm, all, all I can say is after these, these two plays, I'm glad the Celtics ended up winning the game. Well, that, you know, this is exciting basketball. Let's not forget about that. The big picture is that this is exciting. Celtics come in there. They're a good team this year. Uh, this Isaiah Thomas young man is doing very well. He's been doing well. He's better and better. He's playing against the top noise maker in the NBA, which is Steph Curry, and uh, it's an exciting game. Mm -hmm. But in terms of officiating the game, you, you want to keep it exciting, but you got to keep it balanced and equal and fair with the rules. And uh, I just think the guys just didn't know what to do in this scenario. It looks so much of a of a crazy debacle that they just said, you know, let it go. And that's what happens when you don't know what to do. You end up letting it go. Um, but you got to be prepared before these things occur of what can happen. You know the screens are coming. You know the shooters are coming, and you got to react to them. And you got to put your uh, you got to put yourself on the line and call these plays and say, hey, you have to help yourself. I can't help you. You know, you go through the red light. It's a ticket, and God forbid there's an accident. And that's all this is about. Write the ticket up. It, you know, it keeps people from making errors uh, later on because they know they will be called for it. Right. Um, and speaking of seeing things differently, uh, later on that night, we had the um, Heat and the Lakers in an interesting marquee matchup between Kobe and Dwayne Wade. But uh, it sounds like Mar uh, Mar Marcelino Huertas wanted to take a little of the uh, limelight away from everybody. When we started the clip, I, I started it right when, they're sh when Lou Williams is shooting a free throw because we can see that Huertas gives him a high five. He's right in the middle of the court, and you can see him even in the background, you know, his arm, he's standing there. But somehow, within about five seconds, he ends up disappearing. So, Ronnie, tell us what you think about this play because he starts, he, he goes and he hides behind the, the coach. Never seen this ever before and uh, gets a steal. What do you, first of all, have you ever seen this before? Well, you know, uh, I have not seen this in particularly before. I have been, I've been spoken to about it where the player sometimes hides uh, down the offensive end near the standard of the basket. They kind of want to blend in and camouflage off the court. Uh, they've been warned to stay on the court, but I've never had to deal with an incident where someone deceptively hides. Now, listen, as the good book says, there's nothing new under the sun. So uh, the bottom line here is that we have this basketball has this in general, a rule that you cannot deceptively hide somewhere off court. Uh, now, you can go to the corner as long as you're on the court. Um, and you notice coaches will say, hey, who's, who's got him way down here? Because sometimes players don't know where their assignment is. But uh, deceptively hiding off the court is a technical foul. I don't think uh, there's anywhere in basketball it does not exist throughout the whole world, uh, whether it's in the NBA or high school or, or AAU or wherever. You cannot deceptively hide off the court, making it look like five against four or something, and all of a sudden pop up like he did. And if you really look at him on the uh, again, you'll notice he's ducked down. He's really hiding behind the coach. And by the way, it's his opponent coach 
because he doesn't even know he's there, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he shoots out and he gets the uh, he gets the flick of the ball coming from behind the uh, the guard bringing the ball up. Now the trail official is there right in front of that play, but I guess you know if it's the last thing you're looking for, then you're never going to know to see that and. Uh, you know, I, I thought there would probably be some specific rule about you cannot leave the court uh, intentionally. Is that is that part of what we're talking about here? Right. You, you can't leave the court to play the game off the court. And now, now we know on baseline screens, people follow people around on the, off the court, sometimes uh, on the sideline, on a handoff. Somebody may be off the court to get to the other side. That's all part of the game. You, you can't play the game off the court. But there are situations that make sense. Uh, you know, you coaches always say, hey, put your put your foot on the line. So you really use the line as an, you know, don't give any space on the screen or whatever you guys want to talk about. Right. But the bottom line is that you can't deceptively play off court in a game of basketball. And this was deception. And it's the same, by the way, let me bring up the rule about going to the free throw line. If you know that you're not the free throw shooter and you go to deceive to be a free throw shooter, you know, most refs will say, hey, it's not you. What are you doing here? And the guys smile. But the rule book says if you do that and uh, all of a sudden it's caught to an embarrassment by a, an official, he will definitely give a technical foul. And in this case, I think the official is just surprised. He's like anyone else saying, did I miss him? Where did he come from? Mm -hmm. And never thinking that he would be doing a deceiving uh, maneuver. So uh, in all fairness, he was just as surprised as everyone else. And, you know, a rule of thumb in officiating, if you're surprised by a play, you're probably going to suck on the whistle because you're not sure what you have. Mm -hmm. And that's really the best judgment you can have. Now, you may stop the game and ask for help because I, where was this guy? And then continue the game if no one can help you. But that's the, the best he could have done other than to see that on his way up, he was hiding behind, uh, I think it was Coach Spolster. Yeah, well, uh, fascinating stuff. And it, I think it you know, takes somebody who's from Brazil to bring into that you know, something we've never seen before in the NBA. So uh, yeah, it definitely seems like, yeah, the whistle should have blown uh, one free throw uh, for the Heat, and then they continue on with the ball. So um, didn't really affect the game too much, but certainly uh, some, some levity and, you know, an interesting rule there that probably nobody knew before that. So certainly great. And also the fact that you can get a tee if you go to the free throw line. I like that as well. So, uh, you know, the game isn't about deception, you know, when you're trying to see the rule of the refs. Uh, but certainly, you know, the other parts of the game when you try and slight and fake and move around like you used to do back in the days at GW, are, those, are the, those are the deceptions that we try and, uh, you know, uh, do on the court against your opponents. Yeah, while you're on the court, by the way. While you're on the court, right, right, right. So uh, terrific stuff, Ronnie. Thanks for, uh, for hopping in here, and uh, congratulations again on your, for your alma mater's win. Um, and we can't wait to see what's going on. We're moving toward the, uh, the playoffs, so there's going to be some really intense stuff happening, I imagine. Yeah, I'm excited about seeing it. You know, basketball is at a real heightened uh, kind of stratosphere right now in, in a lot of places. Uh, you know, the NC2A is balanced uh, pretty good. The big people have been losing. You know, the NBA is very talented. Whether you're the 30th team, whether you're the first place team, it's about how organized the players are. And talent, of course, speaks to himself, speaks to itself. But there is talent on every NBA team. And by the way, in my trips to Europe, over in the EuroLeague as well, there is talent there also. They, they keep increasing the quiver of, of arrows in the teams of uh, the, the NBA as well as they begin to recruit more and more players who are, are more and more competent and uh, they fit right in. So we're dealing with a worldly game. And uh, the NBA, of course, is the leader at this juncture. Absolutely. Well, you're the leader at this juncture for us and what we need to know about the refereeing and what's happening on the court. So thanks for joining us. Stay tuned next time for another edition of Core Call. And don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. You in? Are you in, Ronnie? I'm in, Coach, and glad to be here with you.